What's up, CP family? What's up, everybody? Chad here with Andrew, filling in for Tim. Tim's overseas right now in London, doing some stuff, pretty cool stuff over there. Um, and Andrew's gonna be joining on the tiebreaker today. We got a great, great show for you. If at any time during the show you got a question, drop us a line. And we'll we'll answer it. This is kind of an interactive show. I know we got a couple new people tuning in today, so just want to let you know. Don't be a stranger. Ask your questions, and we'll get them answered. Um, I want to start out this, um, today kind of talking about a big part of our company. Huge, huge part of Complete Performance. It really is like the fabric of everything we do here, and that's the P3 formula. The P3 formula. If you don't know what that is, it stands for performance training, personal train. or sorry, excuse me, sorry. Uh, the P3 formula, personal development, player development, and performance development. That's like the three aspects of mental training that we really uh, do here. And we got a couple questions lately that says, what exactly do you guys do for that performance development? Mm -hmm. Right. And we're going to dive into that today and give you guys a lot of tips of what you can do because that, at the end of the day, that's what everyone's after. Everyone's trying to perform their best on the court, right? Mm -hmm. So whether you're getting better as a player or getting better as a person, you know, you're playing tennis, you want to perform your best in competition. That's what everyone's after. So, you know, the, the player development aspect of the P3 formula, that's, that has to do with everything that you're doing to get better as a player. And we have mental tools that we do for that. That's all your on-court time. That's our you know, that's, that's where we get into mental progression. That's where we get into our audio cue, visual cue, echo drills, and then in the zone. And in the zone starts to um, teeter on that edge of performance development, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's player development as well. So the next thing is personal development. What do we do for that? That's where we really dive into um, the athlete as a person, those intangibles. Um, we do this through discussing concepts, journaling, affirmations, you know, um, among other things, but we really, we really believe in a lot in that CP building up the person, and even the more advanced parts of that training gets into performance development as well. But Andrew, why don't you dive in here? What's your develop? What's your definition of performance development? And then we'll kind of dive into some of the stuff that we do here for that. Yeah. So performance development, it's it's essentially playing. At your optimal level, playing it at the at that you know that version of you that's your the 100% best tennis player, best person um, possible, and that's what that's kind of the outcome that's um, desired with the performance training is how can we get you to consistently play from you know most players say they're consistently playing 50, 60, maybe 70% of their potential. How do you make that jump to 100%? Um, you know because if you're if you're training on a day-to-day -day basis, you're expecting a slow improvement. You increase like a percent or two or three every week, every month, and, and improvement is really, really slow. So what's cool is um, performance development is less of this like slow improvement and more of like this unlocking type thing where it's like you just unlock it, open the door, and you jump 10, 20, 30 percent. Um, and I think later on we'll, we'll talk uh, about a few athletes that kind of um, experience that jump and that, that um, unlocking of their potential. And there's just a few critical things. Um, so the, really kind of the basis of performance development is, is removing these, these limiting beliefs off ourselves, limiting, uh, removing these barriers or these ceilings, um, mostly with the mental game, but I'm sure you'll talk about how that, how that ties into the physical training as well. Um, but it's really how you're, how you're um, responding to adversity. The only thing that's guaranteed as an athlete and as a person in life is you're going to face adversity. And I was just talking to someone about this on a jump start, and it's like, there's a certain amount of people playing at, you know, when you're, when you're 10 or 12. And as you start to age up, less and less people are competitive. Well, what happened to those people? Yeah, some people just quit because they didn't like playing, but it's the people that were unable to maintain um, this solution mindset, a positive mindset, um, believe in their capabilities, have that confidence, you know, that <laughs> essentially everything that performance development is, development is in the face of adversity. So the, the adversity when you're 10 or 12 years old isn't that high. So there's a good amount of people that go to that next level. But as you get higher and higher, as you get into the 16s and 18s and, and then the college level and then the professional level and then the top professional level, there's less and less and less people there. There's less people that can maintain the performance aspect of this, of, of the game performing while 
um, battling that adversity. And every, every step higher you go in, in age group or, or skill level, there's less amount of people because less people respond to that adversity properly. So um, everybody's mental limitations are, are 100% predicated on how are they responding to adversity. So, um, you know, adversity comes, it's the only thing that you're guaranteed. There's going to be easy times, there's going to be hard times, there's going to be good times, there's going to be bad times. And the players that are better are responding to that adversity in a manner that's productive um, to their game. Such as, you know, if a player hits a shot out, they can say one thing like, I, you know, I stink, I'm terrible. And that's going to make them feel less about themselves. And then they're going to have negative emotions. And then those negative emotions are going to, they're going to cope with those negative emotions a certain way. It's usually through pity, feeling sorry for yourself, getting mad at yourself, um, or blaming someone else or blaming a circumstance. And then that leads us right back to not performing our best because we're not feeling good about ourselves. You don't feel good, you don't play good, and it's kind of this vicious circle. And that's the, that's the circle that the vast majority of players are in. And that's the circle that we're looking to break um, in, that, in that performance development. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, dealing with adversity is, is, is pretty much is, is the make it or break it deal when, when it comes to competition. And as, the, as a physical trainer, I love using physical training as, the, as kind of that tool because to introduce an athlete to adversity while getting them, you know, a better athlete at the same time, right? Mm-hmm. We're not just going to do, you know, at CP, we don't just do fitness to fill time. Oh, it's a rain delay. Let's get our fitness in. You know, it's very strategic, very efficient, and we're also building a mindset. And it starts with that reaction to adversity. Uh, I'm sure you, you people on the blueprint, our athletes on the blueprint, when you're in that ISO hold, you, you, you want to quit. You want to drop. You're faced with adversity and there's nowhere to hide. And what we're training there, we're training more than your muscles. It happens to be very good for your muscles. You happen, happen to be getting very, very strong very, very quickly. But what it's doing is it's training a mental reaction that you're faced with every second you're in that hold. You can either fight or you can drop or you can quit. Fight or quit. And every second you kind of have to make that decision. And what that's doing is it's making the athlete more and more resilient. And that translates immediately on the court during competition. During competition. Mm -hmm. That's performance training in a nutshell, right? That's performance Mm -hmm. training right there. And how I like to explain to my athletes is, like you have a choice, you can either fight or you can quit. And there's two doors. You hit the you hit the fight door, you're in a hallway. You got two more doors, fight or quit. Choose fight, you're in another hallway and another hallway and another hallway and another hallway. And the only way to get into these hallways after hallways after hallway, hallways is to be putting yourself in situations where you're going to face adversity and getting comfortable in those deep hallways so to speak Mm -hmm. and that's where the champions are really built up that's where the resilience are really built up and that's what we do here um, at cp and we take it to a whole nother level um when they're when when someone's here in person and i'm right in in someone's face right yeah you know um i know we got a lot of athletes around the country and the world that do these you know on their own some of you are lucky and have a training partner some you know, they're doing it on their own day in and day out. And I've been there too. He's been there too. And that builds a special type of character too, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes these athletes just need uh, someone to kind of bring the adversity right to them. You know, it's a whole other level. Yeah. And um, I was actually listening to this psychologist. He's one of the top psychologists, um, this behavior psychologist. And he was saying, he says... um, scientifically speaking, the amount of yourself that you can unlock or that you're not accessing right now is directly proportional to the, the uh, magnitude of the challenge you choose to embrace. So the bigger challenge, not, not, just, not just like want to like do these challenges, not just like to, oh, I think I'm going to do it. Or I don't want to try to do it, but like actually making the decision to embrace the challenge of whatever magnitude that challenge is, that's the magnitude of of what you unlock about yourself. And he's talking about seriously scientific stuff like neurological pathways, stuff that actually exists there that you're just not 
experiencing right now. You don't have access to it because you, you haven't embraced that challenge. So he was saying, ultimately, you know, if you decide to take on and fully embrace the biggest challenge in the entire world, that would unlock the, the biggest and best version of yourself. And he said that's the only way to do it. Um, so he was saying how taking responsibility is one of the, is essentially the only, it's like the only pure, um, it's like the only pure type of motivation. It's like the most pure intrinsic motivation there is. As soon as you take responsibility, you start to unlock certain aspects of yourself. And that's really what it comes down to. When we're teaching performance training, it's you want to feel capable. If you feel capable, you perform close to the level of your potential. Yeah. When Serena Williams goes on the court, she feels capable. And when she misses a shot, that doesn't affect how she feels about herself. She doesn't feel any less capable. And you might say, well, we, well she's Serena. She's really good. Well, she wasn't always that way. And she had to develop that response. So um, going back to the, the point on adversity, adversity is going to face everyone in every single type of form. And, you know, I, I, I split it up into two different things. You can either feel capable or you can feel incapable. There's a million different, there's a million different aspects. But let's just, let's just keep it at two here. Capable and incapable. And if the response, if the res if your response to that adversity is thoughts that make you feel incapable, such as I can't do this, I stink, this is too hard, this is overwhelming, this is too much, that person's ranked too high, anything like that, it makes you feel incapable. And when you feel, when you feel incapable, you start to have coping mechanisms and enter those vicious cycles. So, um, what we want to train is as the adversity gets higher and higher and higher, we have a higher ability to maintain that sense of capability. And the first thing is, is people don't really give any attention to their capability in the first place. So as far as your brain or your mind is concerned, you are not capable because you don't think about it. You give zero thought to your capabilities. I ask this to, to people on jump starts all the time of how much, you know, let's say you're practicing 20 hours a week. What percent of that time is focused on something that you need to change, something that's wrong, a flaw in your game, um, something you need to change in technique, something you're doing incorrectly that you can improve? And the answer is 90% or more, usually 100%. So 100% of your training time is predicated on what you're not good at. That's what you're thinking about. That's what you're focusing on. So all your brain knows, all your mind knows is I'm incapable. If I was capable, I wouldn't have to work on these things. The equal and opposite reaction of trying to improve and focusing on these weaknesses and the things you need to change is you don't feel good about yourself. So what we want to do is, obviously that's important, you got to improve your game, but you want to start giving attention to your capabilities so your mind knows that you actually have these capabilities. So the first thing, and I'm sure a lot of you have already heard this because I do this on almost every jump start, is I want you to think about the best forehand you've ever hit, best backhand you've ever hit in your life, best serve you've ever hit in your life, best volley you've ever hit in your entire life. Now, if every single time you hit the ball, you did it your absolute best, people would be astronomically better than they are. Well, that's 100% of your capability. So now your mind knows that there's a certain level I can perform at and I'm actually capable of doing it because I've hit those shots in the past. So now that's the thing. It's like, that, that's possible. So how do I get to that point? Well, your mind doesn't believe you can do that because you never think about it. You only think about how you, how you mess up your forehand or how you stink at your second serve all the time. So as you start to give more attention to that capability, you start to change the response mechanism, the fight or flight mechanism. It's kind of that same mechanism. As soon as adversity hits, as soon as the opponent cheats, as soon as you hit five shots in a row, as soon as you double fault, you have this response mechanism that says, that doesn't matter, I'm still capable. And that's hard to do. That's the level of maturity that it requires to have performance. This is why some people perform at 50% of their potential because 50% of the circumstances that are adverse, they choose to respond to it in a, in, a, in a way that they feel incapable. And a lot of people think that this is, they don't have a choice in the matter. And they're partly right because they have a deeply ingrained pattern to think that way. But it doesn't mean you can't change it. You can change any, any mental pattern that you have. And it, it just requires some work. And that's what the performance training is. So you want to have this response of, as soon as something happens, I'm capable. Well, before you say like, I don't wanna to lie to myself, because it might seem like you're lying to yourself, but it's really not. So if you think about, say you hit five shots out in a row, would you, would you, would the typical athlete feel worse about themselves? Absolutely. Yeah. Every, they'd be throwing their racket. They'd be upset and emotional breakdown. I'm sure some of you parents are kind of smiling to yourself because you've seen it. And what if you hit 20 shots out in a row? I mean, you, some people would be crying and walking off the court. Other people would just want to quit, quit the match. 20, 20 shots in a row. Well, think about this. If you hit 20 shots in a row, 
the, the amount of capability that exists inside you is no different than before you hit those 20 shots. Yeah, it's crazy. So people make the assumption that because I'm playing bad right now, that means I'm bad. And it's this overemphasis that we put on results. Everything is result oriented. And we go by it second by second by second, shot by shot. That's why everyone rides this roller coaster of emotions because one shot they hit goes in and they're like all happy and the next shot they hit goes out and they're all sad. Where if you based it in the fact that you're capable of hitting a ridiculously amazing shot, relatively consistent, that's not going to matter. Because you, you, you've trained yourself to respond in a way that, that builds up your capability or, or better yet, focuses on your capability. That's the one thing we're in control of as humans is we're in control of our, where our focus lies. And if we focus enough on, that, on the fact that we're capable, we're going to begin to believe it. And when adverse circumstances come our way, we're going to rely on that. And we're not going to go back to um, this negative pattern of thinking of I'm incapable. And the whole challenge of the sport, the whole challenge of life is, okay, that's great. You can do that when you're 10. Can you do that when you're 12? Can you do that when you're 14? Can you do that when you're 16? And time's running out between now and a scholarship. Can you do that? That's a higher level of circuit. That's a higher adverse circumstance. That's harder to deal with. It's harder to ignore the result when the college you want to go to, their coach is watching. Now what? Have you trained to the extent that you're going to perform in that moment? Because if you train from age 10 to age, eight, to age 17, but you mess up on that moment, you weren't ready for it. Should have done performance training. That's what it comes down to. Do you, you, want, you need to build the response mechanism. And interestingly enough, what you were saying with the physical training, all of our training centers around this one, this one concept of building up the fight or flight mechanism. Are you, when adverse circumstances come your way, are you leaning into it or are you cowering away from it? Are you treating it like an opportunity or are you viewing it as an obstacle? Do you actually enjoy it? Or is this something that you're forcing yourself to do? And those are the differences between the people that get the Division I scholarships, win the national tournaments, and go on to have pro careers, is they're able to do that at a higher and higher and higher level. Yeah, and like the cool thing about this is when people hone in on this type of training, it's not like, you know, improving your forehand, like it, it's going to take, you know, years to improve your forehand another 30, 40%. Yeah. It's going to take you years to um, serve 40%, but like, you can perform, like if you're playing 40% below your capability, you can bridge that gap like overnight. Yeah, in a like second. it's like, like that's, that's what can happen. I mean, everyone has experienced playing well or playing mm -hmm. their best, right? That's mm -hmm. what we're drawing out with this type of training. Mm -hmm. And that's really exciting. So some of this is doom and gloom, but that gets me excited. Yeah, right? absolutely. Because it's a lot of a lot of training is a drag, you know. It's not it's not fun to do stuff hard all the time. You gotta embrace the challenge, but it's not necessarily fun and an improvement can be slow. Um, but you know, you just brought up the fact that you can jump from playing at sixty level, sixty percent of lower potential to ninety pretty quickly. Um, you know, a good story of that is Sai. I think we mentioned him last um, last tiebreaker, but you know, Sai got started on the blueprint uh, just days before he was going to Winter Nationals. And he was excited. He's 16. He was playing in the boys' 18s. And it was a Friday. He was playing on Saturday. Got started on Thursday. Friday, he said, hey, guys, can I come in and have a mental session? He said, great, let's do it. And came in here, sat essentially right there. And we had a talk about this same exact concept. Um, and so we talked about the fact that there's there's the, that version of yourself, that best version of yourself, the one that can hit all those awesome forehands, backhands, serves, and volleys, that, ver that version literally exists. Like it's an actual real thing that exists in your, in your mind, in your muscle memory, um, in your nervous system. It's there. You just have to access it. And the way you access it is by shifting your focus to the fact that you have it rather than, shift, rather than always focusing on the fact that there's these million things that you think you need to improve. All that's going to do is going to make, make you feel you know, bad about yourself. And that's why you have a coach. Let your coach, let your coach worry about what needs to change in your game. You focus on you. Focus on you. It's, and it's this concept between of the, the trainer and the performer. So before I get into that, um, Cy heard this talk. We talked to him for about an hour and a half about, about harnessing that capability that exists inside of those. It was only homework going into Winter Nationals. 
And he came in that Friday, kind of, kind of, you know, down a little bit as opposed to the pre- previous day because the draw came out. He figured out who he was playing. He was playing the sixth seed, who he had lost to three times prior. And so he came in. He's like, yeah, you know, lost this kid three times. He was really still really positive. I was really proud of his positivity in the face of adversity. But you could tell he was a little bit lower energy than than when we saw him the day before. And I said, it doesn't matter if you're playing at your best. Which is it? Is it a good? a very good chance you're going to beat him, 100%. Okay, then that, then it doesn't matter that you're playing the sixth seed. Actually, you know what? Let's play the sixth seed because not only is that going to make you be on point right at the beginning of the tournament, but then you have a sixth seed's draw once you beat him. And sure enough, Saturday came, side beat the sixth seed, won the second round, won the third round, and had a really close fourth round with another seeded player. Had a phenomenal had a phenomenal outcome. So super proud of you, uh, Sai. Um, and that's just... That's harnessing the performer inside you. So sometimes it's easy to understand how this works when you, I I talk about the trainer versus the performer. Part of you is focused on training and part of you is like the performer because they're two different things, going to, going to practice and, 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 and improving your game and the performing of just kind of letting everything go. It's kind of the difference between your right brain and your left brain, being logical and being, being creative, you know, because when you're performing, it's a flow thing. It's something that just naturally happens. When you're training, it's very rigid, disciplined, um, and and kind of laid out, you know, point by point. And you're and you're. It requires a lot of mental focus. Um, so the better way to understand the performance trainer, first of all, nobody gives any attention to the performer. If you're 99 percent trainer and 100 percent performer, you're you're just going to feel bad about yourself because you're constantly thinking you need to improve all these things. So the better, you know, in some different types of teachings that are related to this. Um, people label them as the judge and the victim. And the victim in this case is the performer and the judge in this case is the trainer. And the judge is like this, this thing inside us and, and, and it's like, we have this certain expectation and if, which is usually perfection. For some reason, we have this expectation of perfection, which is completely ludicrous. And that's something that really needs to change. That's why people get down when they miss a shot. <laughs> yep, absolutely. So they set this expectation and then 99.9% of the time, they fall short of it because we're not perfect. Nobody is, not even the best player in the entire world. And if we're short of it, the judge whips us and goes, no, you're bad. And we respond to that circumstance with some type of negative feeling. Then we cope with that negative feeling by usually through pity, getting mad at ourselves, pointing the finger, or feeling sorry for ourselves. And there's no quicker way to play at the smallest amount of your potential than to pity yourself. It is the number, if I had to do, if I had to work with, if I worked with a player and he had to do one thing, he or she had to do one thing, don't pity yourself. Do not get mad at yourself, do not feel sorry for yourself, and do not point the finger. It doesn't, it doesn't, that's it. That's all you have to do. That's the number, it's, it's the, pity is the process of you convincing yourself that you're not good or that the situation is too much for you to overcome. That's a dangerous process. It's a dangerous process the fastest way to play not even close to your potential. So that's why they call it a pit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You don't even want to go close to the pit. Don't even, don't even look at the pit. Don't, don't even think about the pit. It's, it's terrible. You, you'll fall in that pit and it's really hard to get up because it makes these, it makes these um, kind of these ruts and these vicious cycles that are, that are really hard to get out of. So, um, so, so with that capability, so a lot of people, they'll face these adverse circumstances like, hitting, maybe they hit three or five shots out. And like I was explaining before, you're still just as capable. So it's this, it's this emotional response of, I don't feel good about myself. And it comes down to the judge kind of whipping you and saying, boom, you, you're, you're not good enough. And, that le- and then we have negative emotions, then we feel pity, and the whole cycle continues. Now, what you want it to be is you want... Um, not to be the judge and the victim, but the judge and the performer. So typically when there's a judge, there's going to be a victim and you don't want it to be that way. So if you start taming the judge back, don't get so critical with yourself and stop expecting perfect, that victim will turn into a performer. And now that's what you want. You want, that's what performance training is. You want to go out on the court and play your absolute best. Most players that I talk to that are top 200 in the nation, I said, if you played your absolute best, would you be top 25 in the nation? They're like, yeah. I said, okay, well, that's what you're capable of. That person exists inside you, but if you're choosing to constantly point out to yourself where you're doing things wrong, you're never going to feel good enough about yourself to play that good. 
You know, feel good about yourself, that's just another word for self-esteem. Very closely related to your self-image, which is performance, performance 101. Your self-image is 100% correlated to your performance. They operate the same level. You view yourself as higher, you perform higher. That's what it is. Um, and just kind of a little side note on, on the self-image. So the self-image is part of the self-concept. So the self-concept has three parts. There's the self-ideal, there's the self-image, and there's the self-esteem. So your self-esteem is obviously how you feel about yourself. Your self-ideal is that perfect version of, that you view yourself or want to be. And your self-image is what you currently view yourself at right now. So if your self-ideal is much higher than your self-image, is what you want to be is much higher than what you believe you are at right now, the bigger that gap is, the lower your self-esteem is, so the less you feel about yourself. Now, your ideal doesn't necessarily change. It's, it's pretty much stagnant. And what you would probably need to do is lower it because we're expecting that perfect. So once you get your self-ideal in the right spot, if you give more attention to your capabilities, what you're actually capable of, you feel better about yourself right now. And as that self-image gets closer to that self-ideal, and that gap gets smaller, your self-image gets, your self-esteem gets bigger and you feel better about yourself. You're closer to where you want to be. Nothing actually physically happened. It's all with where you're directing your focus. You can only focus on one thing. There's a million things happening in the world. You can only focus on one thing at a time. You focus on the bad things, it's not going to make you feel good. Focus on the, on the good things, it's going to make you feel good. When you feel good, you play good. When you play good, that cycle continues. And that's performance training. <laughs> yeah, now, that, that question came in and I was like, man, we can literally talk about this for 20 to 30 hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is the core of what we do here at CP is everything builds up to the pinnacle of what we're talking about right here. And that's, at the end of the day, performing your best in competition. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we went a little long there. This is a little bit longer tiebreaker. If you're just tuning in, make sure you go to back to the front. We'll post this right away and watch the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, let us know um, what you thought about this uh, you know, discussion. And also, let us know what you want us to talk about next week. Uh, Tim will be back here uh, next Tuesday. Um, we base this show off the questions from you guys, um, the topics from you guys. Uh, we talk about this stuff all the time anyways, so let us know what you want us to talk about and we'll talk about that. Um, there's no place I'd rather be on a Tuesday night than with Andrew and my CP team talking to my CP family. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, have a great rest of the week. We'll see you next Tuesday, same time, same place, 9 p.m. Eastern. Peace, guys. Take Love these guys. You.